Today it's our delight to welcome with us Dr. Juan Martinez. Dr. Martinez is Vice Provost and Professor of Hispanic Studies and Pastoral Leadership at Fuller Theological Seminary. Since coming to Fuller in 2001, Dr. Martinez has also served as Associate Provost for Diversity and International Programs and as Director of the Center for the Study of Hispanic Church and Community. Among other topics, his current research focuses on the history of Latino Protestantism, Latino Protestant identity, ministry in Latino Protestant churches, Latino and Latin American Anabaptists, and transnational missions among U.S. Latinos. Dr. Martinez joined Fuller from the Latin American Anabaptist Seminary in Guatemala City, Guatemala, where he served as rector for nine years. A Mennonite Brethren pastor, Dr. Martinez also has experience in church planting and teaching in both religious and secular venues. He served as Director of Hispanic Ministries for the Pacific District Conference of the Mennonite Brethren Church and of the Instituto Biblico del Pacifico, a Mennonite Brethren Bible Institute. Most recently, Martinez has published the books Churches, Cultures, and Leadership, Los Protestantes, Latino Protestantism in the United States, Los Evangelicos, Portraits of Latino Protestantism in the United States, and Walk with the People, Latino Ministry in the United States. Please welcome with me, Dr. Juan Martinez. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Juan Martinez. Uh, I'm a professor and vice provost at Fuller Theological Seminary. The, today's topic has been of interest to me both as a Latino born in the United States, but who spent years of work in Latin America, but also because of the links between uh, what I will call today evangelical theology, and you'll notice on the PowerPoint that it says evangelical, not evangelical, and I'll explain that. Uh, we have about 45 minutes, which is not a good amount of time for a Latino preacher, but we're going to make it work. What we want to do during those 45 minutes is to set a framework to the theological influences that are most common amongst uh, Latino, Latin American Protestants throughout the continent, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the differences in emphasis, but most of all, we want to talk about what's common uh, amongst most Latinos, uh, Latin Americans who are Protestant in Latin America. And we want to think about those contributions, uh, evangelical theologies, and how they contribute to the global church, and also specifically to the church in the United States, where many of you are from. So that's where we're going. That's what we hope to get done in the next 40-some uh, minutes or so. If you look at the, the second uh, slide, you will notice uh, what I call the principal influences on theological thinking and on the church in Latin America. Now, I put it in the form of a pie just to give a sense of what are the major uh, uh, types of theological influences on Christianity in Latin America. You will notice that the biggest piece is Roman Catholicism. Historically, Latin America has been a Roman Catholic continent a, up to just a few years ago, many countries in Latin America, Roman Catholicism was the official religion. Uh, that has now ended, but only uh, within the last 10 years was the last country formally disconnected from, a, uh, from having Roman Catholicism a state religion. But to date, in most countries of Latin America, for example, if you're not Roman Catholic, at least confessing, you would never be elected president. So Roman Catholicism... It influences all of our thinking. It influences Protestant thinking. It influences everybody because it is part historically of how we think about the world. Uh, and many, many people say that Spanish is a Catholic language. Uh, our vocabulary, uh, many of the, of the ways that we frame and, dis and describe reality are strongly influenced by Roman Catholicism. Also, the indigenous religions, uh, 500 plus years after the conquest of uh, Latin America, still the indigenous religions, especially in those regions of Central America, Southern and Central Mexico, and, and the Northern Highlands of uh, South America, the indigenous religions have had a very strong influence. And even though many times they're, they're linked uh, nominally to Roman Catholicism, sometimes to some form of Protestantism, but mostly to Catholicism, you still see them in the background. You still see them especially in Mexico and Central America and, and these other regions as part of the background understanding. How do we think about God? How do we think about the world? 
Um, especially in areas where there was a large movement of African slaves in the Caribbean, on the coast of uh, South America in particular, you'll see the influence of African-based religions. So to date, you will see practices, you will see thinking that reflects African religions. Of course, uh, from the middle of the 19th century, what I would call classical Protestantism, uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Episcopalians, uh, sent missionaries to Latin America, and so they're a piece of the puzzle, but if you look at the picture, they're not a really large piece of the puzzle, where Pentecostalism, which starts at, uh, formally moving to Latin America after the Azusa Street Revival in 1906, has been taken a large piece of the puzzle, and the charismatic, what we would call neo-Pentecostal movements, uh, which are similar but sometimes somewhat different from classical Pentecostalism, become another large influence. And then what I call other Christian groups. We're talking about Mormons, we're talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, which fit within the larger frame of Christendom. This is not a, an apologetics class to talk about the details of it, but to recognize that especially Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses have had a fairly significant influence in Latin America. So those are kind of the big pictures. Now, as we go to the next slide, uh, I want us to think about, as, as, we, as we frame the theological pieces, that in Latin America, there's always been a difference between what I would call the official and the popular religion. This is the most Christian continent in the world, but in many ways, Christian faith uh, and various expressions of Christian faith have been expressed, have been lived out in ways that don't always fit the official categories. So that when I say popular, it's how people practice their faith. It's not popular in the sense of a vote, though in many places it would be the majority of people, but popular in the sense of how the people live out uh, their uh, faith, their religious practices. And many times they are formally separated. You'll see a, a difference between Catholicism as that practice in the churches and Catholicism as practiced by the people. And sometimes there's some pretty big substantial differences. And you'll also see this at times, especially in Pentecostalism, not so much in other forms of Protestantism, where there will be a difference between how the official church says things and how people actually confess their faith and live out their faith. Now that comes from Spain. Um, one of the, the ways, the tensions uh, that the, the, the conquistadores, the ones that came to Latin America and the religious leaders that came to Latin America, how they brought their faith. Uh, there's a very common sa saying that I've translated there, may the Lord keep the bishop far from here. And, and that kind of a sense that, that we're Catholics, but uh, we say in Spanish, a mi manera, in my way. And so a lot of popular Catholicism, and, and we don't have time to talk about that, is different than the official Catholicism. And that sometimes is very helpful for understanding the United States, where the assumption is that what you see is what you get. In other words, the formal structures and the practices of the people somewhat line up. In Latin America, popular religion is often much more important in understanding Catholicism and even some forms of Protestantism than the official church structures. Now, all of this is in a changing religious context. Latin America is the most Christian continent in the world. That's something that most of us don't recognize. It is more Christian as a continent than North America. It is more Christian than Europe, which obviously is becoming secularized. According to Philip Jenkins in his book, The Next Christendom, by uh, sometime in the middle of the next decade, 50% of all the world's Catholics will live in Latin America. And that's not because Catholicism is shrinking. That's about the growth rate of uh, uh, demographic growth rate of Latin American people that are at least born into a cultural Catholicism. Because at the same time that you have that, Latin America, the percentage of Pentecostals and Protestants in general as a percentage of the population is growing strongly. So we have both of these phenomena where the number of Catholics continue to grow in Latin America because of demographic growth, even though the percentage of the population that would call itself Catholic is shrinking. So both of these phenomena are happening at the same time. So this is part of the change. Latin America has been historically a Catholic continent. 
it's rapidly becoming a Protestant continent, yet nonetheless, even with all those changes, it's still a very Catholic continent. And as we see with the new Pope, Francis is from Argentina. And that is not a mistake in the Roman Catholic Church recognizing the shift, uh, the demographic shift of Catholicism. Of course, you will also notice, and I just mentioned it briefly, that there's a growing presence of world religions. You'll see Islam, especially uh, in various parts, a missionary-oriented Islam, though there are also immigrants from uh, the Arab world. And uh, some, a growth of, uh, of agnostics, uh, sometimes called atheists, most of them more agnostic or, or disconnected from formal religion. Uh, in, in the next slide, even though it's in Spanish, uh, it, it, it kind of charts out the reality of Guatemala, and I hope that you'll be able to look at it more carefully. At this point, I'm just including it to demonstrate Guatemala is the most Protestant country by percentage of Latin America. And according to this latest study that came out about two and a half months ago, uh, the difference in percentage between Catholics and Protestants is only seven percentage points at this point. In other words, over 40% of the population of Guatemala would call itself Protestant, and only and less than 50% would call itself Catholic. So the reality is that you've got a situation where almost half of the population would, would, would self-identify as Protestant. Now, uh, at the bottom of this chart, there's, there's some comparisons of other countries in Latin America. Again, don't want to spend a lot of time looking at the chart, but to frame the changing context. One thing is you read the chart. Where it says atheist or agnostic, it usually really means people that are not formally connected to a church, that would not name, I'm Catholic or I'm specifically kind of Protestant. Uh, the number of actual atheists, people that would actually say, I don't believe in God, is not that large. But the categories get mixed up. So just as you read this, uh, take that into account. Though, especially in those countries more influenced by European immigration, especially the southern part of South America, and also Cuba, you will see a larger percentage of people that look not unlike the secularization that you're seeing in Europe and in many of the same kinds of influences. So this is the changing um, religious landscape. Now, because those who know something about Latin America and usually talk about liberation theology, I want to take in the next slide just very briefly to talk about it not because it's a direct influence, but because if people know about Latin American theology, they usually first say liberation theology, and so um, want to get it out of the way, if you will. Uh, to understand liberation theology in one slide, uh, you, you need to think about this, the history of Latin America, the political tensions of Latin America, the economic and religious realities. That one of the one of the facts that, that many of us don't think about with liberation theology is that, especially Roman Catholics, though there was also many Protestants that have been a part of it, say, if Latin America is the most Christian continent in the world, why is there so much injustice? And so, because for their perspective, especially Roman Catholic, you're Roman Catholic and you're Christian if you were baptized as a child. And so if you've accepted that premise, in other words, everybody's Christian because they were baptized as Roman Catholics, then why, why is injustice so deep? And so this is the kind of question in practical terms that the people that were addressing liberation theology or looked to that as an answer were dealing with. And so they talk about some of the find, uh, foundational issues. God cares about the poor. Well, there's massive socioeconomic injustice in Latin America to this day. People need to be liberated, not only saved, but they need to be liberated from structures of injustice. And if God reigns in the world, what does that mean in societies where there's fundamental injustice, even though we talk about being Christian? And of course, a lot of people talk about Marxism and, and, and say, well, Marxism is anti-capitalism, which is anti-Christian, well, that's a simplistic kind of an answer, but one of the realities is that capitalism as system was part of the problem in Latin America, and so that's why many look to Marxism as a way to counterweigh that. But the other question is, how do you bring about change? You see, for example, in the United States, we talk about the Revolutionary War. We needed a revolution, but now we want change to happen by reform. Well, 
is change is revolution needed for change? And many times we 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 like the revolutions that happened a long time ago. We don't want to see revolutions today. And that was part of the tension in Latin America. Is there such a thing as redemptive violence? Is there such a thing? And again, those, those are other debates. I don't want to get into them. But that raises questions. When we think about salvation, how is that linked to living a life of freedom today? What does the church do? How does it work in society? And what do you do when the state is officially linked to religion, but then uses that religion to oppress the people? And so these are the kinds of questions in the background, the religious background, and that's why I briefly mention them, though I don't want to stay there. So now we're going back to Protestantism. In the next slide, uh, José Miguel Bonino, in 1997, wrote a book published in Spanish that you can find, The Faces of Latin American Protestantism. And he talks about four large categories that have almost a historical reference. The first Protestants that make it to Latin America, either as migrants or as missionaries, are what we would call liberal today. The Presbyterians, the Methodists in particular, some Baptists, uh, some others, but mostly Methodists, Presbyterians, and classic liberal, 19th century U.S. liberal or European liberal, and there were they went to Latin America with the gospel, started schools, started hospitals, and wanted to influence society by bringing change into the middle and upper classes, and they wanted to teach people how to read so that they'd read the Bible, and assume that that's how they were, that the gospel was going to create change. In the late 19th century, the early 20th century, what we would call traditional evangelical today from the United States mostly, uh, sends missionaries, mostly faith missions. Uh, some of the well-known ones, uh, like translators, Wicca Bible translators, Central America Mission, Latin America Mission. These are organizations that, from an evangelical base, uh, go and preach a gospel of personal transformation, of accepting Jesus Christ, but usually are disconnected from the, from the structures of power, where liberal Protestantism wants to influence the structures of power. The evangelicalism works more in the lower, middle and lower classes and wants people to read the Bible, but is not nearly as concerned about the structures. In the middle of all that, there was also migrants, like there were to the United States, such as there were Swedish Baptists or you know, Italian Catholics. There were Italian Valdesians that went to Uruguay. There were English um, Anglicans that established churches in various countries of Latin America. And so that's another strain, the ethnic migrant that brought their churches with them. And then the, the, the one that is the largest today, Pentecostalism and, and its variations, uh, which again starts with the with the Azusa Street Revival, but is spread out much more broadly than that. And so, Amigas uh, Bonino would say, if we want to understand Protestantism in Latin America, we have to be attentive to all four of those streams. I want to focus principally on two and four in that list, and in two as mediated through four, because uh, in many ways. Uh, uh, being evangelical and being Pentecostal or Pentecostalized in Latin America, they're almost linked together. You're hard-pressed in most places in Latin America to find strong Protestant churches that are either not Pentecostal or influenced by Pentecostalism in some way. So what is the, the broader context today? In the next slide, just very briefly, we've mentioned some of this. Uh, the East-West conflict, which was you know, communism and, and capitalism fighting each other, and capitalism won. But the issues in Latin America that created the massive civil wars and injustice, remember 250,000 people were killed in Guatemala, 200,000 in El Salvador in long-term civil wars that in the United States were framed as East versus West. But in the reality of those countries was about the powerful rich, for example, in El Salvador, there, you know, 20 families control 80% of the arable land of the country. And those kinds of situations did not get resolved. And so many of the political debates, why, why has El Salvador freely elected a leftist a president? 
the issues haven't been resolved. Now with globalization, the way globalization hits Latin America is, yes, there's all this business and all of these opportunities, but there's also the globalization of drugs. Remember, the United States is the chief consumer, and Latin America is, is one of the chief producers. And in Latin America, a lot of the gang problems, a lot of the destruction of social structures are due to the fact that the, the mafias and the gangs that control drugs have so much power. They have more power than the governments do or than the local governments do. And they're, if like it or not, they're funded by the United States who buys the drugs. And so, and then also migration, both south to north. If you have been keeping up with the news, at least when I'm um, taping this, the children at the border from Central America and other kinds of migration issues. And no matter where you land, the reality is that because of globalization, people are moving out of Latin America, but also into Latin America and throughout Latin America. And all of this influences the how people think about their faith and how they practice their faith and how they take their faith with them. And as I already mentioned, the changing relig uh, religious relationships, where you have a Roman Catholic Church that is feeling very defensive about the, the, its changing role, about not being as influential as it once was, but a growing Protestant, Pentecostalized kind of church that is now kind of trying to figure out its place. A place like Guatemala, all of a sudden, half of the population calls itself Protestant. Well, what does that mean? What, what, does that make a change for life in Guatemala? It, does that make a change for half of the population that is indigenous, that has been uh, oppressed historically? So all of those kinds of things are the contexts. So now we're ready to think about Latino theology, evangelical theology in and of itself. Uh, as we think about that, first of all, a very brief history. I am a sixth generation Latino Protestant. My great, great, uh, great grandmother became a Latino Protestant in South Texas because my roots are uh, in Latino in Texas. When people ask me, uh, when my ancestors migrated across the border, I remind them that it was the border that migrated across my ancestors because my ancestors were in South, Te what is now South Texas when it was part of the Spanish colonial period. And it was the United States that moved the border south over them and made them American citizens. Now, as Protestantism reaches out first to the people of the Mexicans of the Southwest and into Latin America, uh, most people that had a conversion experience, like my great-great-grandmother, uh, had been raised in a cultural Catholicism, but not a spiritually vital Catholicism. So they were Catholics by name, but not by any actual lived experience of God. And so they read the Bible, they had an encounter with God, they, uh, through Jesus Christ, they had strong conversion experiences, and the way they told their narratives were basically anti-Catholic. In other words, Catholicism is dead. Catholicism is the problem. If you read the Bible, the Spirit of God will bring uh, conversion. And therefore, as we thought about what it meant to be a Protestant, in many ways it meant to be an anti-Catholic. And, and a lot of our early theology, and, and, and even as, as I was a young boy growing up, in um, uh, Latino church here in the United States, our hymnology talked about we used to be persecuted. We, we were persecuted because we accepted Jesus Christ. But the road of persecution is the road of faith. In one fact, one of the most popular hymns of the 1960s, 70s, written originally in Spanish, Hay una senda, there is one way. Talks, it's a testimonial about being persecuted by Catholics. And so, that's part of where the story begins being told. We are not Catholics. We have had a conversion experience. But as, as evangelicals develop, there is a question. Do evangelicals have a theology? Because many times, once we started thinking about our faith, basically we were only translating the books that were given to us by the missionaries. And so, in many ways, theology is translation. Whatever was said in the North, we picked up 10, 15, 20 years later, and that became our theology. 
Well, the problem with that, especially as we think about the changing reality in Latin America and the, the civil wars that will start in the 1940s and 50s, that, that are about power, about will the rich control everything because they're anti-communist, will the United States support them, which many times they did. One of the most famous in the 1950s, the Somoza dictatorship in Nicaragua, it is said that uh, President Eisenhower said, uh, Anastasio Somoza may be an SOB, but he's our SOB. And so that made it all right because he was pro-American, therefore the United States often supported these kinds of regimes. And so in the middle of this, does the gospel have an answer? And a whole generation of young evangelicos, some names that, that may be known by some of you, Samuel Escobar, René Padilla, Orlando Costas, later here in the United States, start asking the question. And they will later be called the radical evangelicals, the radical evangelicos. Because they start saying, does the gospel have something to say to this situation? And many of the missionaries were telling them, well, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. We shouldn't be involved in this. Or beware of this because this is communism. And they're saying, does the gospel have something to say that isn't, this is communism? Or on the other hand, no, we just walk away from it and we only think about heaven and we don't think about change today. And so that young, gen what at that point was a young generation, ends up in Lausanne in uh, 1974 and connected with John Stott. They start asking questions about the gospel and the gospel having an impact in all of life. In Spanish, misión integral, uh, uh, integral holistic mission. It's different than holistic mission as is usually used in English, but that the gospel has to speak to all aspects of life. And so they became, they, they started to develop their thinking around Misión Integral, uh, and especially, like I said, in Lausanne, kind of the first very broad global platform. And they would continue to speak into civil wars, into the injustices of Latin America, and would say, does the gospel make a broad whole cultural change? In the middle of all of this, then, the growing Pentecostal movement. And I put evangelicals and Pentecostals because uh, some evangelicals, some traditional Protestants in Latin America saw themselves as different, even as historically early in, in the 20th century, uh, for example, the National Association of Evangelicals didn't know what to do with Pentecostals. Did they fit or not fit? And, and you saw at, at first as Pentecostalism is developing in Latin America that, first of all, it develops in this different social class. Traditional Protestantism is middle or lower middle class, and Pentecostalism is amongst the working poor and the very poor. And, and so they live separate lives. But as Pentecostals started blossoming and growing, uh, do they fit? Are they part of this evangelical world? Uh, or are they something different? And so some, even to this day, some evangelicals want to say evangelicals and Pentecostals. I would argue no. Evangelicals are pretty much Pentecostals. Uh, the vast majority of those in Latin America who would be in the Protestant category are Pentecostal or Pentecostalized because Pentecostalism has just blossomed. And we could talk about why, I would argue principally, because the way the message is, is presented touches the life of people in very direct ways. Now, another part of this reality is that over the last 20, 25 years, Latin Americans have started sending missionaries to the rest of the world. They're not just a continent that receives missionaries, it's now a continent that is sending out missionaries. And so it's taking some of this message, especially into the Islamic world, especially into places where most North Americans can't go because it's a lot easier to go to uh, various countries in the, in the Middle East with a Guatemalan or Costa Rican passport than with a U.S. passport. Uh, and also because many uh, people in Latin America look like they could be Arabic or they could be uh, Indian, uh, East Indian. And so they find at least the first superficial connection a lot easier to happen. And also they, they're doing mission from a different perspective that makes it possible for them to enter many parts of the world that we would normally consider closed or more difficult to send missionaries. So 
evangelical theology is developing from anti-Catholicism to a theology as translation to Mission Integral to, to the influence of Pentecostalism and now to a mission theology. How are we missionaries around the world? Now, when we think about Pentecostalism, uh, there is a saying that is attributed to two different uh, sources, and I'll mention them both. One is that uh, Amerino Nun in Guatemala uh, said this. Another is that Samuel Escobar, the Baptist missiology for Peru, said it. Liberation theology opted for the poor, but the poor opted for Pentecostalism. And so what you see in Latin America is that Pentecostalism speaks to the lived experience. It's a vital Christian faith, a vital Christian experience that speaks to and, and has impacted especially the poor throughout Latin America and that it has been very attractive and that even amongst the poor that are Roman Catholic, they're often influenced by a, a charismatic version of Roman Catholicism because the way that life is expressed and the way theology is expressed in Pentecostalism has a very strong influence and has had a very vital influence in Latin America as it has had throughout much of the global south. Now just very quickly so that we're aware there are very shades of Pentecostalism. There are the American or European mission-based Assemblies of God, Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, these kinds of movements, some of the some of the European Pentecostal movements uh, that are part of uh, the, the, the large movements of Pentecostalism. There's also movements that have started in Latin America. In fact, some of them have sent missionaries north uh, to the United States. Also, the new, the charismatic movement within Catholicism, the newer mega churches that are usually neo-Pentecostal, that, that are a mix of Pentecostalism with sometimes a health and wealth gospel, and also some new religious movements that are kind of on the edge of Christian and, and one has some serious theological questions to ask, but they're strongly influenced by a Pentecostal understanding of, uh, of the world, a Pentecostal understanding of how we look at faith. And so today, uh, Pentecostalism and Latin American reality, our next slide, we can see that many forms of Pentecostalism are about popular religion. I mentioned the beginning, the concept that that the way people live out their faith and the way it's officially expressed don't always match. And so you will find that a lot of uh, Pentecostals, especially in smaller, uh, poor churches and in, 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 in the edges, uh, marginalized areas of urban areas, uh, they practice a faith that is very communal, that is very committed to each other, but you know, if you started asking theological questions about the preaching, about how they interpret scripture, you might kind of go, hmm, uh, this is, you know, the way they live out their faith and the way they talk about their faith doesn't always match up the official doctrinal statements of, Catholic, of uh, uh, Pentecostalism. Uh, so you have various expressions. In fact, uh, you know, the, the, the saying that Pentecostals don't grow by multiplication, they grow by division. That you, you see new Pentecostalisms, new movements, new uh, churches all the time. And so you have all kinds of interesting expressions. Like I said, some of them somewhat marginal. Um, if you were to ask kind of the theological questions that I assume would be asked by a class like the ones that are uh, listening to and, and participating in this class. But Pentecostalism has evolved, also influenced Catholicism, and I like to think about two types of influences. One is from within, that uh, the most vibrant forms of Catholicism in Latin America and in Spanish-speaking USA are usually the charismatic ones. And many of the people that are in those movements would talk about having born-again experiences. They would talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, they would have the trappings and some of the theological framings about Roman Catholicism that we might have some serious questions about, but nonetheless, the way they experience faith, the way they express their faith, they would have also have spoken in tongues, they would also have had the same kinds of very vibrant and very alive experiences. So, in one way, 
Roman Catholicism in Latin America is influenced from within by charismatic influences. But it's also influenced by without because most of the growth, most of the people leaving Roman Catholicism are joining Pentecostal or Neo-Pentecostal churches. So Roman Catholicism in Latin America will talk about being ecumenical when it's talking about Protestant churches that aren't growing. But when it's about Pentecostals, then they've got some serious questions. And in, in Latin America and in Spanish or in Portuguese, they will talk about the Pentecostal as sects in the full negative sense of the word. So that uh, the Protestants are, you know, can be separated brethren like the official language that's used in the United States. But the Pentecostals, they're sects, they're problem. And, and so uh, Roman Catholicism is caught between does it interact with Protestants or does it fundamentally challenge Protestants, especially those Pentecostals, which are the ones that are growing and which are the ones that are taking particularly the cultural Catholics out of Roman Catholicism. And the interesting thing is how these Pentecostalisms deal with the, the social cultural realities that I briefly mentioned earlier. For example, the poor Pentecostals, the ones that are in the marginalized, the peripheries of the major cities out in the rural countryside, they really practice a commitment to help the poor, to help each other, and to walk together, and they challenge the structures of injustice. And so you will see not a liberation theology, but a practiced liberation, a desire to be free from the structures of injustice. But sometimes on the other end with some of the neo-Pentecostals, especially those that preach more of a health and wealth gospel, they're almost justifying the injustice. In the past, Roman Catholicism, at least the official structure, often said, well, yes, there's rich and they're poor, but that's how God set it up. And so even as the poor have to deal with their indignities, the rich have to deal with their own indignities. And so justifying the structures of injustice. Sometimes in some of the neo-Pentecostal churches, you get some of the same thing. Where no, it's the neo-Pentecostals that are justifying the systems of injustice and saying that's the way God wants it, or if you're rich, it's because God blessed you, and never asking the questions, well, how did you earn this money? How did your ancestors earn this money? Was it done justly? So with all of that, what, what would be the theology, uh, next slide, of Latin American Pentecostalism. I'd like to point to at least four major things. One is there's a strong belief that God intervenes in daily life. In other words, that prayer does influence reality and that God is present today, not just as kind of a vague thing, but as, as one who actually makes a difference in how I live my life today that our faith should not be mediated through human structures. And that's why it, you know, the, the idea of, of a free church model of Pentecostalism, where uh, it's, the, it's the Spirit of God that speaks to anybody. And so it's not controlled by the powerful and educated. You don't need a seminary degree or a college degree to be a pastor. You just need God's giftedness and God's call. And you don't have to have all the structures of power, but you also don't have to have a lot of money. Many times, for example, in the United States, when we think of doing mission, we think about budgets and we think about what we need. Well, uh, the poor Pentecostals never got the memo that you needed money to do mission. Uh, they probably couldn't have read it anyway. They, many of them are illiterate. And so they understand that Christian faith will not be controlled by denominations, by structures, nor by the powerful. That anyone can receive God's call, be converted, and also preach the gospel and lead churches. And also that it, it does break the curse of systems of injustice because the poor are blessed by God. So the system may be unjust, but God cares about us. God speaks to us. God gives us his Holy Spirit. And so as, as, as pen, poor Pentecostals in particular, they go, God cares. Nobody else may care but God cares. And so we see kind of those, those four big themes. And Juan Sepulveda, and I've got a quote on the next uh, slide, who's a Chilean Pentecostal, says that the Pentecostal principle in Latin America is the protest or the rejection of the absolutization of any cultural mediation of the gospel. Those are very fancy words. What do they mean? 
They mean that any time we try to say the gospel must look like this. It has to have this kind of theological or denominational framing. It has to look like big church buildings. It has to look like these structures. No, the Spirit of God breaks beyond those. And Pentecostalism refuses to have the gospel mediated through Americanism, American Protestantism, American Evangelicalism, American Liberalism. That Pentecostalism says, no, the Spirit of God continues to be at work and active today, and the Spirit of God always breaks out, is not bound by the structures that we humans create and say the gospel must fit, must fit our denomination, must fit our theological framing, must fit our understanding of the world, must fit an American or a European understanding of Christian faith. So with all of that, what does uh, an evangelical theology offer a globalized church? Well, we have those, uh, uh, those various things that, that are around the circle. We recognize that, that the gospel has to be a whole gospel for all of life. That any preaching of the gospel that doesn't speak to all of things, especially to structural injustice, especially to situations where sometimes in the name of the gospel we justify injustice. So one of the contributions of evangelical theology is a whole gospel for the whole of life. Secondly, that the Holy Spirit is active. Many of us uh, in the United States have been called deists. We talk about God, but we really don't believe that God is active right now. Is God active in your in this classroom and, and the people that are watching this? Is God active in this process that we are involved in right now? One of the, the, the contributions of, of uh, an evangelical theology is to say, yes, we need to recognize that the Holy Spirit is active in daily life. A third contribution, I would argue, is mission from below. What does that mean? For the last 500 years, both Protestants and Catholics have assumed that mission happens from power to periphery, be it from Catholic or Protestant Europe, be it from the United States, where the powerful take the gospel. And so they take money, they take all of these uh, things that are necessary to do good mission, and they go out to the poor, they go out to the peripheries. But Latin America is, the, is part of the periphery, is the global church, and so mission is being done from the powerless to the powerful. The South is sending missionaries back to the North. In fact, you will see that a growing presence in Europe, and I, I think we're going to see it more in the United States also. Which takes us to the fourth, I think, very important principle of evangelical theology, is that the poor, those at the bottom, are not just objects of someone else's mission, they are subjects of God's mission. That God does use the poor, that God does use migrants, that God does use those who the world does not consider important. And in fact, I would argue that if you want to see where God is at work in the world today, don't go to the structures of power, go to the peripheries. And that that's one of the contributions of Latin American evangelical theology and of most of the global south. It's the poor who are not waiting for someone else to missionize them. But they are being agents of mission. They are sending out missionaries. They are, if, if they're migrants, they're taking the gospel with them. So as we think about, uh, next slide, evangelical theology for a globalized church, well, we see how globalization, migration is affecting Latin America. We've got movements within Latin America to the various countries, migrations from outside to Latin America, migrations from Latin America, and we think of what oh, we've already talked about to the north. And that's changing the face of the continent, but these people, as they migrate, they're taking their faith with them. One of the interesting things about many of, of, of uh, evangelicals as they migrate, they see themselves as missionaries. I spent nine years working in Guatemala directing a, a seminary of the Mennonite Church, and when we were talking about returning, my family and I, to the United States, Many of the Guatemalans says, why do you want to go back to the United States if this is where God is working? 
And I said, well, no, this is my, you know, the United States is my country, my people. I need to, I need to also be involved in, in my own country. And they said, well, if you're going back, go back as our missionary. Go back as one who will take this message and, and, and will talk about the spiritual diamond dynamism of Latin America and of the majority world in general. And so we see transnational people taking their faith and doing mission. And we see mission going north and south. We've usually, and, and most, most North Americans think about mission from the north to the south. But we're not attentive to how much mission is happening from the south to the north. And, and so Latin America is becoming part of the global church. It's taking that sense of, of the whole gospel for the whole world, the Holy Spirit involved, of mission from below, of the poorest subjects, not only objects of mission, around the world. Now, I've been using evangelicals and evangelicals as different terms throughout. Um, what are the differences? What are the similarities? Well, the evangelicals are children of mostly U.S. evangelicalism. It was missionaries that took the good news of the gospel. It was, it was Latin Americans and Latinos in the United States who heard the call of the gospel, who accepted it. But they took it out more broadly many times than what American evangelicalism has gone. They were facing different issues, the structural injustice, the life in, 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 in poverty and sometimes structural poverty. And so they develop more broadly so that the word evangelico is broader in many ways than evangelical in English. And that's why I use it differently. It's almost synonymous with Protestant because almost all Protestants in Latin America are evangelicos. Very few would claim not to be where we have very clear differences in the United States between evangelicals and non-evangelicals in the Protestant community. And this distinction is important in the globalized world because the vast majority of evangelicals in the world look more like Latin American evangelicals than they look like U.S. evangelicals. So that U.S. evangelicalism has been the mother. God has used the, the U.S. and European evangelical missionary movement to spread the gospel in this way. But evangelicalism has become a broader movement than that base. And a movement that, that has... A, a much stronger sense of the Spirit of God and a dynamic that is much stronger, I would argue, than what is happening right now in U.S. evangelicalism, to give one example. So what do these evangelicals contribute to U.S. churches? Well, as we think about reality is that if you look at the churches in the United States, well, the traditional mainline liberal churches are either, are, are, are either disappearing or self-destructing or sometimes shooting themselves in the head, it seems like. But many evangelical churches are not growing either. And if you look at where growth is happening in the churches, it's happening amongst minority and migrant groups. So, for example, just one Protestant group, the Assemblies of God. Almost 40% of their population is now Latino. Almost half of their denomination is not white. And the only parts of the Assemblies of God that are growing are the non-white parts of it. You could say the same thing for the Southern Baptists. You could say that for other evangelical denominations that are seeing some level of growth, it's almost all happening amongst Latinos, amongst other immigrant groups, amongst minority groups. And so the contribution of evangelicos is almost very direct. And these migrants are bringing... A, more, a very dynamic faith, a faith that believes that the Holy Spirit is still at work in the world, and, and they're changing the face of the church. Just to give it Los Angeles as, as an example, if you were to just walk into all churches on any given Sunday in Los Angeles, just take a picture, over half of the people in church are not white. And that dynamic is starting to go across the United States. It won't be that much into the future, I believe, in revival, and I pray that the secularization that is largely a white phenomenon in the United States will be changed by the Spirit of God. But seeing current realities, the church in the United States is more Southern, it's more minority, it's more migrant, and that's where the Spirit of God seems to be moving today. So I believe in God's future. As, as we get to the end of our presentation, our last slide, uh, if we believe that God continues to work in the world, we need to be attentive to the places where that 
that work is happening. Because I do believe in God's future, I look toward evangelical mission and theology as one of the places where I can learn about God's future and God's work in the world. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, it's good to have you here, and I have a at least three main comments I would like to make in response to the excellent presentation that uh, Dr. Juan Martinez did. And as you know, well, Latin America is too broad and there are many issues to, to cover. I think the, the essential one that we all need to understand is the importance of Roman Catholicism uh, in Latin America. Uh, just to give you again a little bit of background, uh, when Columbus discovered America in 1492, uh, that same year, uh, the kings of Spain, uh, Isabel and Fernando, who got married, united the kingdom, they also were able to expel the Jews and the Muslims from Spain and also to unite the country. Uh, now, when any country takes control of the, con of the other region, or governors take control of the uh, region, they do two things. They impose the language, so Castilian cast became Spanish, so it's the same, Castil Castilian or Spanish are the same. But also, these two kings, Isabel and Fernando, were known as the Catholic kings. So Catholicism became the official religion of the kingdom. Therefore, that became the official religion in Latin America. As a matter of fact, the, the Pope, Alexander VI, in 1493, he awarded the new territories to uh, Spain and Portugal under two conditions. One, that uh, everything, all regions will belong also to the Catholic state, will be Catholic countries, and the people will be instructed in the Catholic faith. So for, since the very beginning, Roman Catholicism became the state religion. And interestingly, uh, just as a case on Mexico, Martin Luther and Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador, they were contemporary historical figures. So Martin Luther was born in 1483, Hernán Cortés, the one who conquered the new Spain, or all from the middle of the United States to Central America, he was born in 1485. Uh, Luther died in 1546. Cortés died in 1547. The conquest of Mexico began in 1519, and 1517, that's when Luther nailed his 95 Thesis uh, on the door of Wittenberg on October 31st. Um, the final uh, conquest, of, conquest of Mexico ended in 1521, and that's in 1521 where Luther defended his faith against uh, Charles V. So as you can see, even the when the Reformation was growing in Europe, Spain was conquering Latin America or, and Portugal, and then they were under Catholicism for more than three centuries. Uh, Catholicism was official religion. Uh, another important background, Charles V also was the king of uh, Germany. When he moved to Spain, also the king of Spain, Charles, the first of Germany, the fifth of Spain, he, des he decided he will not uh, face the same situation he was facing in, in Germany and many other countries in Europe. So he installed or established the Inquisition with, with the purpose of uh, rejecting, keeping away, and killing Lutherans or Protestants. And that's the, that's the case where... Uh, for centuries to be a Latin America, to be an Spaniard, that meant to be a Roman Catholic. It was illegal to be a Lutheran. Uh, I'm tempted to continue telling you a little bit about the Spanish Reformation. That's one of my passions, but I will uh, stop here. Otherwise, I will use all my time dealing with that. But that explains why to this day, Spain is one of the countries with the less Protestant or evangelical presence in the world, less than 1% of the population. And for example, in Mexico, uh, the separation of church and state didn't happen until 1857. So before 1857, it was illegal, it was against the law not to be a Catholic. And that was the same case in, in all uh, Latin America. So Protestantism is fairly new, but it has been growing, exploding, and the presence and power of the Roman Catholic Church has been diminishing. So they are still the majority. Uh, to be a Catholic is part of the culture, but uh, the Protestant faith is growing. And interestingly, when one becomes 
an evangelical when one accepts the gift, free gift of salvation, uh, it's very common for us to say, I became a Christian. So in my case, I was born and raised Roman Catholic, and when I was 11 years old, I, I became a Christian. I accepted the gift of uh, salvation of Christ uh, at the Vacation Bible School. And even Catholics use that term. So in, in North America, some people have a struggle to say, well, Catholics and Christians, are, I, I, I thought they were the same. Catholicism is just another denomination. Well, not such. that's not the way it's perceived in Latin America and in Spain. You, become, you are a Christian, that means you are a Protestant or Evangelical, and you are a Catholic. And the main issue is the, the issue of salvation, soteriology, which uh, for me and for many people is a key one. It's, the, it's an essential one. Uh, so the presence of Roman Catholicism is diminishing, and yet it still is part of the culture. Another important thing is that uh, the terms Protestant and Evangelical are synonyms. In our context here in North America, many people refer to Protestants as more mainline groups and Evangelicals, uh, Protestants with a certain flavor. In Latin America, those terms are just synonyms. Evangelicals, Protestants, they are the same. Uh, well, so that, that, that's one thing, uh, the presence of Roman Catholicism. Just the last comment I want to make there is, when my father became a believer, um, first generation uh, Christian, he gr he grew up in a very strong Roman Catholic family. His bro older brother is a priest. Uh, my father went to Catholic seminaries. He worked as an accountant for almost 30, year, uh, 30 years at the main Catholic offices in my hometown, Guadalajara, Mexico. Well, when he started attending an evangelical church and he became a believer, he became the black sheep of his family along with his mom. He was rejected, expelled, excommunicated, he lost his inheritance. His own mother st started calling him the donkey. She said, well, or the animal, because only in the, through the church there is salvation. If you leave the Catholic Church, well, what is the difference between you and a donkey? You're just like an animal. Uh, he was fired from his job. He lost his retirement. He was almost only two years, uh, two years shy of retirement, and he lost everything. Uh, my dad passed away four years ago, and I, at the funeral, my uncle, the priest, he even showed up at the funeral, and even another, at that place, he went where the body was, and he told, and he told him, I was next to him, and he said, I still cannot believe how you became a Protestant. You, are, you were raised well, uh, so you brought shame to the family. That's a, a still very part of, uh, of our culture. Uh, in my case, only my Two brothers and my mom will be Protestants. The rest of my family are Roman Catholics. And my wife is the only non-Roman Catholic in her family. Uh, so that's a sharp distinction between of, sal of the issue of salvation. <clears throat> the other important point that uh, you see, I want to stress is the issue of poverty and how religion or faith, Christianity, relates to poverty. I, I remember one once here in uh, Samuel Escobar, which is a very important Latin American theologian, uh, talking about hermeneutics. And, and he said that he always used to ask people in on the audience when he's teaching how to study the Bible, what did Jesus mean when he said, the poor you will always have with you? And of course, that, that's in the context of, uh, of a story in, 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 in the Gospels. But most of the time, everybody hears that word and says, well, that means there's always poor and you have to help the poor, and well, uh, we need to do our best, but poverty is an issue of life. Uh, but one day, there was an old lady who was in the class, and she answered, well, that means that there will always be oppressors that will make us poor. And the point is, you see that passage with different lenses, if you are poor or if you are the not poor. And many times we approach the issue of poverty as if we are not the poor. And yeah, those, yeah, those people, poor people. But if you are the poor, you see the faith in a different, with a different way. And that's what is happening in Latin America. It was a poor nation, poor region, uh, I'm sorry. And then we have the, received the gospel mainly for North America uh, with a huge emphasis on salvation, on the future, and yet without a connection to daily life. They are not addressing the issues of daily life many evangelicals.
So in the last 50 years, a, a, a lot of theologians have been dealing with wealth. How does our faith relate to poverty? And that's where uh, liberation theology became really important. One aspect, uh, not every, not everybody who is concerned about the poor or is concerned about how our faith relates to daily life issues is related to liberation theology or communism. That's another thing. Here in this country, in, in America, we hear capitalism, communism, black or white, no middle ground. Uh, for many people, they say, well, I'm not a communist. I'm not necessarily a capitalist. Is there another option? Our faith can deal with our issues of daily life. Uh, so you could be what in our context could be an oxymoron. You can be a, a conservative, theologically evangelical, and a very liberal, socially speaking, or with a liberal agenda. You know, here is either you are one or the other. In that, in our context in Latin America, that's not the case. Most people will be considered very liberal, uh, socially speaking, in terms of addressing the needs of uh, daily life, poverty, injustice, and yet very conservative uh, theologically. And I think that's uh, an important aspect that many of the Latin American theologians are that, trying to address. So liberation theology as a movement is from the past. It was related to a certain uh, agenda, and it obviously influenced by communism or Marxism. But that concern is, remains, uh, not because we uh, are concerned about these issues. That means we are necessarily aligning with liberation theology. Uh, so this is the issue. How does our faith relate to our daily lives and in this presence? And um, finally, uh, and it was mentioned uh, very well by uh, Dr. Martinez, Pentecostalism is the great largest evangelical movement, not only in Latin America, but in the world. Uh, there are many reasons. One of them, I think, is because they, it's a movement from lay people that relates to everybody else, to everybody, and also because they are addressing this issue of poverty. They connect with the masses, connect with the people. Uh, with experience. I remember being in Cuba, for example, several times, and I, some churches were vibrant in their worship relating to uh, the community, singing uh, hymns or songs with autochthonous instruments, kind of a salsa rhythm. I mean, in another church, not far from that church, when they were, uh, everybody was dressed with coat and tie and singing hymns in the piano, and even though it was uh, July in Cuba, so extremely hot, but I were just imported the uh, model from the 50s here in, in the United States. So Pentecostalism is relating to everybody else, the people, uh, to the masses, and that's why it's one of the reasons it's growing. Unfortunately, one of the weaknesses of that is that they reach everybody, and even though they affirm their uh, belief in the Bible, in the authority of the scriptures, the knowledge of the scriptures is very weak. Uh, so that's also a need uh, from that. I would like to uh, just draw to attention, if you are interested, uh, to a couple of issues. One is the, the Journal of Christian Education. If you Google Christian Education Journal, on the main website, you will see a link to this issue. It's called uh, International Perspectives on Christian Education. And it's free, you can download it. And there's a section on Latin America that a colleague uh, from here at Talbot Viola and I we were the editors. And I have an article on the right the importance of Pentecostalism in Latin America. You could read that. And also in the current issue just came out last week of the same journal, Christian Education Journal. I, I, I wrote an article about the Spanish Reformation. So as I was talking about the importance of the Spanish Reformation, the last point related to that, in, to, before I close, is there were believers in Spain who got converted by, the, by studying the scriptures without foreign inference. Just like Luther was studying the Bible and he read Romans and he said, well, salvation is by faith, by grace, through faith in Christ. The same thing happened in Spain with several people. Two of those are very well known. Casero de Reina and Cipriano de Valera, two year old monks who uh, one translated the Bible into Spanish, the other one revised it, and that's why we have the Reina Valera. So that's 
this is important because people in Spain think that Christianity or uh, Protestantism is foreign. In Latin America, some people think, oh, Protestantism is an American religion. Well, that's not true. They were believers in Spain who became to saving faith in Christ to the study of the scriptures. So I think that that's an, an important aspect to mention. Well, thank you for your time and God, God's presence in everything you do. And if I can be of any help, I don't hesitate to contact you. Presence. Hey, I want to thank uh, Dr. Martinez uh, for that uh, very stimulating presentation uh, and, um, and for um, covering a, a topic that I think is, uh, has been uh, very underrepresented in the um, uh, academic world in terms of its uh, global significance. Uh, Latin American Pentecostalism, I think, is, uh, is a, a growing movement. Uh, the last 40, 50 years, uh, it has really uh, taken off and now is a a community that's actually sending missionaries to North America, other parts of the world, uh, it has um, sort of uh, become a, a central feature in what um, Philip Jenkins calls uh, the next uh, uh, Christendom. Uh, really important story in uh, 20th century and now 21st century Christianity worldwide. Um, that said, uh, while I agree with uh, just about everything uh, Professor Martinez uh, has to say about the uh, dynamic growth of uh, Pentecostal uh, Protestantism in Latin America and even back into North America, I have a few caveats. So um, no point in just agreeing with them. Uh, uh, let me just say some uh, things that I think might be uh, worth considering in addition to what uh, Professor Martinez uh, has um, shared with us. Um, a, a recent book called The Rebirth of Latin American Christianity by Todd Harch, very fine historian and a, uh, and a Christian historian, uh, suggests that um, while the Roman Catholic Church has lost uh, millions of nominal members uh, to Pentecostal churches in Latin America uh, in the late 20th century, uh, the church has in fact, the Catholic Church, has responded in some fairly effective ways. Uh, from the top down, the hierarchy has encouraged lay Catholics to get involved in what are called new ecclesial movements. Um, uh, movements like Cursillo uh, and uh, Opus Dei. Uh, these are designed to help ordinary lay Catholics relearn what it means to be a Catholic Christian in their homes and in their communities. And, and in the process, it connects them much more securely to other lay Catholics uh, and to the clergy uh, than they were before, so that uh, their Catholic identity is reaffirmed and they are far less likely to join Pentecostal uh, churches. So I think that while uh, many nominal Catholics, people that would have said they're Catholic just because they didn't know what else you would be in Latin America, uh, are uh, very open uh, to joining Pentecostal churches, I think the, the period of that kind of rapid uh, shift in uh, membership from the Catholic Church to the Pentecostal Church is probably plateauing if it's, not, uh, if it's not ending since the Catholic Church itself is, well, you might say catechizing their own members in a more effective way than they did, say, in the middle uh, of the 20th century and before. And there's something else going on that's even more fascinating, and Todd Harch, uh, the author of that book, um, the Rebirth of Christianity in Latin America, uh, has also uh, identified, and that is that many lay Catholics have embraced Pentecostalism but not left the Catholic Church uh, in a process that's called the uh, Charismatic Catholic Renewal Movement. It involves lay Catholics bringing Pentecostal practices right into the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, at first, uh, the hierarchy was very suspicious of this movement, but in recent years, it's been largely accepted because it maintains some of the traditional Catholic distinctives, such as veneration of Mary and celebration of the math, uh, Mass. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Hart says that there are now more Catholic Charismatics than there are Pentecostals in Latin America, something like 75 million Catholic Charismatics uh, and 66 million uh, Pentecostal Protestants. Um, don't know for sure about those figures, but uh, he seems quite confident about it, and it seems plausible to me. So that's that's one caveat. The uh, the uh, the challenge of Pentecostal uh, Protestant church growth in Latin America has not just eroded the Catholic Church; it's stimulated the Catholic Church to respond in a way that in that is actually quite constructive, and is making uh, Catholics less nominal, and I think arguably more Christian uh, than was true in times past. Another comment that I think is worth ma uh, making, and I don't want in any anything I say here to uh, undercut what uh, Professor Martinez says. I think he's he's reminded us and, and informed us about some really important developments. Uh, 
but I think it also has to be said that um, uh, while Pentecostal churches are growing very fast because they don't allow themselves to be bound by man-made structures, some churches and leaders in the movement could use some man-made structures. Uh, preachers who have uh, no time for seminary education may be very powerful uh, uh, preachers, but they may also at times be spreading ideas that are not truly biblical, such as the neo-Pentecostal doctrine that uh, prosperity is both a sign and a reward for godly living. Uh, that, I think, is a real distortion of the gospel. It's an understandable one, uh, and especially in a part of the world where people are desperately poor and they want to see economic uh, uh, development in their lives. Still, uh, you have to be careful about assuming that uh, wealth is a sign of godliness. Uh, we know all too well that uh, there are other ways of gaining wealth than uh, by living a godly life. And that uh, many people in poverty are, in fact, very faithful Christians, and yet they remain poor. Um, Moreover, uh, structures of accountability are not just roadblocks in the way of evangelism. Uh, they're guards against financial irresponsibility and autocratic leadership. Uh, and there are some popular pastors. I don't want to tar the whole, uh, the whole group, but we know that there are some pastors who set themselves up as um, caudillos, as kind of like autocratic leaders uh, in megachurches. And that doesn't really reflect... Uh, a biblical model of servant leadership, and it it opens the door to um, bad behavior that uh, that can put churches, unfortunately, uh, in a in a very bad uh, um, give them very bad publicity that, that that damages the credibility of the gospel when people see preachers acting irresponsibly with money, uh, or sometimes being harsh uh, in their treatment of uh, members who who challenge their authority in any way. And I would also like to say that. While it may be fair to criticize mainstream churches and, and even the, uh, the Catholic hierarchy for being weak when it comes to evangelism, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, still, let's remember that in the 1970s and in the 1980s, uh, when military dictatorships uh, were um, uh, in, holding sway over Latin America, it was those very same mainstream Protestant churches and the Catholic hierarchy uh, who challenged these uh, dictatorships for their unconstitutional authority. Uh, these uh, courageous Christians who battled for human rights and economic justice were called communists. And, uh, and many of them were imprisoned and many of them were murdered. Uh, and yet it was a very courageous thing to do and I dare say it's one of the more uh, glowing chapters in the history of Christianity in Latin America. But while they were in fact uh, suffering repression, uh, many of the Pentecostals who now um, uh, enjoy uh, a large congregations uh, were avoiding those kinds of political and economic uh, matters. Uh, they kind of got a free pass by uh, staying out of politics. And um, okay, uh, and they're enjoying uh, the benefits of that today. But, but let's not be too harsh in our condemnation of uh, other forms of Christianity that indeed may not be as effective in evangelism, but that may have emphasized other elements of the Bible uh, and of the gospel that uh, that uh, merit uh, our attention, but are just not as easy to uh, to live out, especially um, under um, autocratic and dictatorial uh, governments. And finally, I think we have to be just a bit careful about church membership statistics, especially in Latin America. It is certainly the case that Pentecostal churches have gained many, many members, millions of members in the last 40 years. Uh, what we don't know is how many members have left during that time. Uh, it does appear that there's a fair amount of churning going on in which people join and leave several churches over the course of their lifetime. And there seems to be a small but growing number of people who are unaffiliated with any church, Protestant or Catholic, and that's fairly new in Latin America where Traditionally, everybody was a Catholic, even if uh, they, it, it didn't mean a whole lot. Uh, it means a lot more to be a Protestant now. It means a lot more to be a Catholic now. But be, because the demands, the expectations of, of being a faithful Christian are, are, more, uh, uh, are, are better articulated by Pentecostal pastors and by Catholic priests and, and nuns, uh, I think there are more people that decide, maybe I'm really not up to those demands. And so you see a, a growing number, small but growing, of people that are just unaffiliated. Uh, and are honestly not part of any church. To sum it up, I think it's abundantly clear that is, there has been tremendous growth in the Pentecostal churches of Latin America, and not only in numbers, uh, 
but in influence such that they are now sending missionaries to North America and all over the world. And, and Professor Martinez is very much to be uh, commended for bringing that to our attention because it's an under-told story. Uh, it, it's just now kind of breaking out into the academic world. Um, these uh, Pentecostals are doing a terrific job of evangelism and in the process they put North American evangelicals uh, and mainstream Protestants uh, to shame. At the same time, I think that the health of the church is not just a matter of numbers. There's also the matter of wise Bible preaching and courageous prophetic witness and, of course, daily fidelity uh, to, to godly living. Uh, and I would add ecumenical fellowship that recognizes and works with Christian brothers and sisters and other branches of the church, even if we're not always comfortable uh, with uh, their approach to, uh, to preaching the gospel or, um, or conducting ministry. In those areas, I think that there is still room for all of us to grow. Uh, Pentecostal believers, uh, charismatic Catholics, evangelicals, mainstream, mainstream Protestants, uh, let's all uh, see Christ uh, as the head and ourselves as members of the body. And then I think the church will truly be making excellent progress. And having said that, again, I don't want this to sound unduly uh, critical. I just thought that uh, probably isn't worth just uh, saying uh, I agree, but pointing out areas where uh, maybe um, further thinking can go on. Uh, Professor uh, Martinez uh, uh, has made an excellent presentation. There's a lot of truth in uh, what he says, and it's a story that really needs to be told. He has told it uh, very, very uh, effectively, and I'm really glad I had a chance to, uh, to hear his presentation. So thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel discussion.